Introducing Nose to Tail, a podcast where we explore the world of aviation lifecycle solutions, insights, and more. Presented by Jet Midwest. Welcome back to the Nose to Tail podcast. We appreciate all of our listeners. I'm here with Richard Woolley. Uh, Richard's been a, a longtime friend, and, and uh, we've worked with him quite a bit in the aviation business. How are you doing, Richard? Great. Good to be here. Yeah, yeah it's kind of nice in front of the microphones instead of sitting in our offices. Maybe you can give the folks out there maybe a, a flavor of what you've done in your professional career and maybe how that led you to aviation. Certainly, certainly, Patrick. So I started off my career as a mechanical engineer. First job was at the Boeing Company up in uh, north of Seattle. Worked in Everett, lived in Muckleteo. If you know where Muckleteo is, that's great. I worked in the jet propulsion labs in the Everett uh, building. So I worked on uh, calculating thrust coefficients for the GE uh, engines. And then I worked on the simulator for the RB211. This was prior to the 747-400 being certified. Was this the 74-300? It was for the 747-400. Okay. So I did flight testing on that airplane, collecting simulator data, and the checking the, uh, you know, my model compared to the actual airplane and adjusting it, working with the rules folks in Darby. And it was great. So we got engineering degree. I... Mechanical engineering from Brigham Young University. All right. So BYU guy. We can't, I won't hold that against you. You beat my cats earlier this year. So, so did you have an interest in aviation at that point? And, or, or were you going to go look for NASA? I was actually really interested in the jet propulsion world. But the gas dynamics class I had in, in engineering and all the thermodynamics, I was fascinated by it. And that really kind of got me into it. So it must be why we're such good friends because I'm full of hot gas and exactly. very interesting. hot air, exactly. <laughs> so you worked with the 524 engine uh, on that project with Boeing. You know, what was the next evolution in your career? Next evolution was I went back to school. I went back to school and got a master's in business administration at BYU. Great program. And out of school there, I was offered a job to go back to Boeing, but I took a job to work at um, a little small aerospace machining company in Provo, Utah, called Avtec Systems. And we did all, I was a program manager there. We did all sorts of aerospace machining, big CNC lathe. We took on programs. We did a big program with the Navy, worked on the MLRS systems. We worked on lots of different programs. Yeah, Richard, sometimes in aviation, we, we forget that we have these acronyms that we use, and some of our folks out there don't have a clue what an MRLS program is. Mobile launch rocket system. There you go. Need parts for it. So that's kind of what we Then we were purchased by another company, Teleflex Defense Systems. I worked there for a while. Then I had a big change in my career. So I got into the hunting bullet industry. Interesting. So I worked for a little company called Barnes Bullets, the general manager there. It was very interesting. I had not done a lot of hunting in my life, um, but I, I had done some design work and I got into helping redesign their bullets so they would shoot straighter, farther, faster, learned all about the design. I ended up buying a, a missile design package to be able to help redesign these bullets. And it was a great experience. And is that a little overkill when you're using missile design to, to knock out the local deer? On no, the no, it's a little missile. That's true. It is a little thing. And it has helped that it shoots straight and it's powerful, right? That's a job to do. So so where did you go from there? I, I started working for, and I worked for a number of years at a company called Cirque Corporation in Salt Lake City. And basically, founder of Cirque was the essentially the creator of capacitive touch input technology. Things that you'll use on your laptop today your little gray touchpad mouse. It had multiple, um, I served multiple roles there, but as, as a manager, as an engineering manager over sales, I worked with large companies like Dell and HP and Lenovo. And So all of those uh, touchpads and all of our laptops originated with you is what you're saying. Actually, the, the technology did, we did get a, a competitor, formidable competitor. So we're not the only ones out in the marketplace. But. All right. So obviously you've got a lot of, you probably had family and things you're there in, in the Salt Lake region, and, and that's probably why you stayed in that area. Now, what's your, what's your exposure? You and I are really, uh, when I was introduced, we were really working on aircraft, right? So you were managing a, a leasing portfolio of some assets. But talk to me a little bit about how you got into that side of the house and maybe what excites you about that part of the business. You know, I had the opportunity, you know, Ken, Ken uh, Woolley, 
my older brother, he he contacted me and asked if I would become the CEO president of this little company called Alta Airlines Holdings. And uh, it was an opportunity to get back into the aerospace industry from a very different perspective, not designing, right. not testing, but more of buying, selling, evaluating assets, working with new people such as Jet Midwest and uh, becoming partners with Jet Midwest. So that's kind of where we came together. They're obviously uh, going from maybe uh, engineering design side into maybe using more of your business degree. You know, talk to me about, you know, what, what do you really like there? What, what drives you your passion each day? Or maybe what drives it differently than it did when you were in the engineering side? It's a good question, Patrick, because it's kind of like a kid being back into a candy store who hadn't been there for a while. It, it's a different candy store than the, than the computer technology world, which is a lot of fun. Or the bullet world, it's also kind of a very fascinating world. Um, when you're walking underneath an airplane, it's just a magnificent creation of engineering creation. It just is. And the whole concept of buying this airplane and getting these engines and putting together and making a whole good airplane is just, I don't know how to say it, it's just cool. And to be able to, to resurrect an airplane that's been in the desert, it needs, it needs a little love, needs a little care, and you can bring this asset back to life. That's kind of a, it's, it's a cool thing to be able to do. And that's what we do. Or we evaluate, as you know, mm, this airplane is not going to come back to life. What can we do with it? It certainly is. Uh, it's actually, you point out, just even walking under the airplane. Um, I was giving a tour to a prospective employee, and uh, she had really only been exposed to the uh, business jet side of the house and, and smaller uh, aircraft. And so I took her into the hangar, and there's a 757, and there's a 777, and she's just, eyes were really big. And sometimes I forget how blessed we are that we get to actually go and experience that anytime we want. They can walk downstairs. And, uh, and and experience those things, and most of the people in the public don't get that opportunity. So it is it is pretty fascinating. And you know, I'm I'm almost in the reverse. Like I'm um, I have this huge passion for airplanes since the business I've been in. Uh, I'm in awe of the engineering that you've done, and really what's been going into these airplanes. Like to me, it's just it's amazing that you can take a seven four seven dash eight. I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast. You know, it's it's just short of a million pounds max takeoff weight. So that's full of people and cargo and the plastic and the aluminum, and the fuel and all these other things. And it flies, you know, whatever, 700 miles an hour for 20 hours and they get off and everybody unloads. And a couple hours later, much more people get on and they turn around and do it again. And uh, it's amazing. To me. I mean, a million pounds. It's a, it's a staggering thing that originated on a slide rule in the uh, 60s as they were designing the 747-100 originally. Right, it's the same iteration, just growing and evolving as the engineering improves. So, uh, I'm pretty awestruck of that side of the house. That is for sure. It's just the engines alone. So, when I was at Boeing on the on the RB211524, we were hitting sixty thousand pounds of thrust. Right, that was fantastic. I mean, back in the 1945, 1940s, and World War II, you had Rolls Royce creating engines that had a thousand pounds thrust, and then a two thousand, and then a four, and then went up to five thousand pounds. Wow. Well, then, so back in you know, the 1980s, he had 60,000 pounds. Now we're hitting 90,000 pounds. Not we, but the engines are. It's just, it's fascinating. It's, these engine cows are what? How big is the GE90 engine? Well, it's a, a, it's a, one, it's a, one, it's a 115 inch fan. So uh, the, the cowling is another couple of feet larger than that. So you know, it's 130 inches roughly uh, for just the inlet cowl. And, uh, but the engineers recognized that they had a, a commercial problem with that, right? So they actually take that engine cowl and they split it into two pieces and designed it to be split so that it actually could go as freight. It actually make it through the door. I have some doors in my building in my warehouse that are too small. They cannot take it into the building because it's too big and they actually have to split it in half to bring it in the regular building. Honestly, a lot of the times when we bring those in, we actually take them into the hangar because the hangar's 20 big. But again, the engineers knew that they had to have a design that could be commercially reasonable. And even with the G90 uh, engine design, it has a, a fan section on the front, which comes up as part of the normal culture maintenance. And you have a fan section and the back end is holster section. And they've designed those so that they can come apart because they're just simply too big to chip somewhere because they're so they're just so big, which again, is pretty awesome. If you think about design, they really understood the obstacles that they were creating by making these engines that much bigger. In the airplanes, because back at the Everett plant at Boeing, it was the world, I think it still is, world largest building by volume. Huge, just monstrous. 
things. And as a young engineer going in there, it's just like, you just look all around. It's just fascinating. It just is. It's fascinating. It's a fun thing. Anyway. Well, certainly Boeing charges uh, an awful lot of money for a lot of these things, but you know, they do take a lot of risk in trying to create this, this these great technologies and, and create these, these flying experiences, honestly, that are uh, pretty spectacular. I mean, if you think about, I, I absolutely love, I've uh, been on the 787 a handful of times in my career. Man, it's a smooth flight. You know, and uh, it's a, it's just a fantastic cabin experience, and and uh, such a smooth flights every time. And maybe I just gotten lucky, and I need to knock on some wood. Uh, next time I get on a seven eight seven, it's not a bumpy ride, you know. But they've done some really great things uh, with the aircraft. So you've talked a little bit about engines and a little bit about the airplanes. You know, usually when I when I have guests, I have people that we talk to in the business. They trend to have a passion towards one more than the other. In fact, a lot of my engine folks are in the industry, engine industry. They never get out. They just stay there. They just love it so much. So is there one side of that that, that excites you more? Maybe the engine's a little bit more, but as I said, in engineering school, we studied you know gas dynamics, and you're dealing with the airflow over the wings and, and, and how that works and the lift and that type of concept. So again, when you walk into a hangar and you look at these airplanes, they're massive, and these wings are just way out there. It, you know, they're, they're flying fuel tanks, right? Right. And, and there's so much engineering involved with it. It's also still a very fascinating thing. Back in the day on the 747, it was the first big Boeing jet to have winglets. You know, you had what, I think they're six feet tall winglets. They might be taller. I like both, but engines are a little more exciting. That's fair. That's fair. I'm kind of an airframe guy. I've been on the airframe side most of my career and relied on other people. So, you know, just even speaking about cargo conversions, um, I know that you guys have been working on a uh, 777 uh, cargo conversion. Maybe you can give the listeners a little flavor of uh, how that project, uh, where it is today, um, and maybe what that looks like. So there's multiple types of conversions one can do. This conversion is for a 777-200ER or a 200 system. It's a Class E cargo system, meaning it has it doesn't have fire extinguishers in it, but it is fire resistant or whatever. And, and it passes that type of a criteria. In fact, we're at to the point now we're doing fire testing on the airplane to make smoke testing. You have to light, create smoke in the fuselage. It's got to, you got to be able to detect that smoke within a minute through many stations throughout the airplane. This particular com conversion, this first one, we call it STC-1, is a hand carry you have to hand load the product on the airplane, but there's a lot of volume in that airplane. So it's a low cost conversion, it does require you to hand load. It has individual IG um, nets to hold down your cargo. Um, and it's designed for quick conversion, low cost conversion, and it's still quite efficient as an airplane. The 777 airplanes are a very efficient airplane. It can go long distances and it can carry a lot of cargo. How does the how does the uh, upper deck cargo capacity look like on on that aircraft compared to maybe a seven six seven three hundred, which is a very popular cargo aircraft right now? Volume wise, boy, I don't know in terms of a factor, but I, I do know the volumes. It's just a lot bigger I, in terms of the answer. It's just a lot bigger. Fair enough. Yep, it, I did know that we had uh, during COVID there were discussions about flying a lot of aircraft with as platers, right, taking out seats and putting cargo in the main cabin. In the discussions on the triple seven two hundred ERs, was that the belly cargo system held as much as an upper deck of a seven five seven crater, which is which is pretty magnificent. Of course, I might have gotten that wrong. It's been about three years since I've heard that, but uh, that's what stuck in my head. So we'll we'll call that uh, uh, close enough right now. But but that's certainly huge for anybody who needed to carry cargo at the time, right? Because we needed additional lift because all of the passenger aircraft were staying on the ground and not flying passengers. And you know, we've lost all the cargo bellies that were flying uh, things that weren't bags. Well, what we're finding, Patrick, is that the e-commerce world continues just to blossom. We're demanding more stuff. We want it fast. We want it quick. There's all sorts of suppliers. We think of Amazon, great supplier, but there's other suppliers as well. There's a lot of cargo trying to get from point A to point B, and you need to have airplanes to haul it around. We'll continue this discussion on the next episode of Nose to Tail a podcast presented by Jet Midwest. Don't forget to please like and subscribe to our channel.